Business Diplomacy Today, the podcast about international relations and geopolitics from a business perspective. We help you anticipate the changing political and societal trends that influence your business. Welcome. My name is Matthias Katon. I'm your host. Business Diplomacy Today is sponsored by the Indo-German Center for Business Excellence. The center is a think tank, research center and network that connects people and organizations interested in business relations between India and Germany. As an academic institution founded in 2021 at Frankfurt School of Finance and Management, it is independent and impartial, but always close to the real world. To find out more about the center, please go to indogerman.center and you can also find this link in the show notes. Today, we delve into the intricacies of artificial intelligence, focusing especially on the UAI Act. And our guest in this episode is Till Klein, a prominent figure in artificial intelligence. Till serves as the head of trustworthy AI at Applied AI, Europe's leading AI initiative, where he plays a pivotal role in scaling up trustworthy AI. His work focuses on the collaborative development of methods and tools essential for operationalizing regulations, standards and principles of trustworthy AI, not just in Europe, but also globally. Till brings a wealth of industry experience, having worked in regulatory affairs for medical devices, served as a lead auditor for ISO 9001. He led quality management in a drone company as well, and his practical skills and perspectives are invaluable in the application of trustworthy AI. He holds a PhD in business from the Center for Transformative Innovation at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. And his research interests are quite diverse and they include also economic geography, economic complexity, social networks, innovation management and regional clusters. Till, welcome to our podcast. Thanks for the kind introduction, Matthias. Pleasure to be here. Now, you have a indeed a broad pedigree and broad interests that uh, all somehow seem to be connected. And I think artificial intelligence seems uh, to be one overarching topic that... I see coming up in uh, your different professional positions that you've held. And that's also what we want to talk about today. Now, probably everyone on this podcast by now has heard of artificial intelligence. I think it's impossible not to have heard about it unless you were under some kind of a rock for the past at least year and a half or so. But we also want to talk a little bit about one specific attempt at regulating artificial intelligence, and that is the EU AI Act. So let's kick it off with me asking you, what specifically is this act? What, what does it try to attempt? What's the scope? And what's in that act? Thank you, Matthias. That's a very good and, and very big question, of course. The EU AI Act is a regulation. Um, it was brought on the way several years ago, actually, so how it came into being was when the EU basically noticed that this new technology, artificial intelligence, is really going to hit mainstream. It's not some kind of a niche that might go away or something, but it really realized it, it will come. And also that AI has a couple of properties that are quite distinct and different from what we've seen before. So for instance, that AI systems may have a certain degree of autonomy or that they opaque um, in, in their nature, meaning their, their outcomes are often difficult to explain. So that on the one side. And on the other side, the EU has observed that there have been a couple of really sort of landmark incidents, so to speak, in the EU um, globally, of course, which really kind of raise concerns that, hey, there, there might be a new type of damage that's coming at us here. And we've also seen some incident databases sort of really piling up and, and some surveys with the Eurobarometer really show that people are also getting a bit nervous, like both professionals and, and uh, laymen and the more general public. And so they brought this you know, thing which started as more of an ethical movement, I suppose, with a focus on what are the values we try to um, align AI with in Europe. And this was turned into a regulation now. It's a 300-page document, basically, something around that. It's a product safety law. You could say, so some actually compare it quite closely with the medical device regulation. 
It's intended to protect health and safety, but also, and this is new this time, it also protects uh, fundamental human rights, um, the rule of law and democracy. And so thereby it's an EU regulation, meaning it will be binding directly. I mean, we do see a couple of member states also getting ready to have a national AI law on top of that, simply for implementation. But yeah, you can look at it as a, as a European law that help, uh, seeks to protect health, safety and human rights when it comes to the use of AI in the European Union. Now, you mentioned there are some concerns about, you know, what AI really is, what comes out of it, where, where does it come from? It's um, At the same time, I guess, it what makes AI so fascinating is also what concerns people, is that it is creative in, in a certain way, so it's uh, capable of producing unique content, unique material, but we also don't often know, you know, what is it based on? And I guess it's two coins uh, of the same Metal, could you explain what are the key aspects that this uh, act tries to regulate? And I understand it's also the first one or one of the first attempts globally to regulate AI. So if you were to name just two or three key elements in that act, what would they be? Number one would be that the EU actually adopts a risk-based approach, meaning it tries to classify certain AI practices into four categories, basically. And number one is that there are some practices that are to be prohibited. They shall not be used in the EU because the EU believes that they are fundamentally against EU values and therefore unacceptable. Um, these are things like um, social scoring, predictive policing, emotion detection in certain contexts like education and the workplace. So the prohibition is one unique thing that we haven't seen elsewhere, I guess. There's another class which is about, it's called high risk systems. These are in principle allowed to be placed on the market, but they need to fulfill quite stringent requirements. And you can compare this with something like a defibrillator or like a pacemaker, if that was a medical device, right? A thing that kind of makes sense, but we can easily agree that it's, it's a good idea to have it tested properly because before you put it into use, because if, if it fails, it will damage a lot. So the point here is, number one, it's really focusing on the usage of AI and it categorizes this into those risk classes. And then depending on that, you have different sort of homework to do. The other part is, and that was also quite debated more recently, is the regulation of technology as such. And this is another key piece here. And it came particularly through the uprise of, of those large language models like ChatGPT, to, to name the most famous one, I guess, is the inclusion of what the EU calls um, general purpose AI systems. So these are AI systems which do not have one specific intended purpose, but can be used for a plurality of, of applications. And also here, the EU puts in certain regulations, but they are independent from the usage. So that's a new sort of point of entry, sort of, so to speak, for a regulator. These would be, I guess, the most two main points I would mention right now. There were two words that you mentioned a couple of times, uh, risk and uh, prohibition. Now, there are a lot of people who say that with this act and actually with most attempts of regulating this kind of new industry, an entity like the European Union or any other country attempting it, they're stifling innovation, they're driving innovation away from their jurisdiction. So that might actually in the long term have a counterproductive effect. And specifically in the case of the European Union, those people who are saying that, they're also saying, well, it might actually backfire because uh, that will mean that AI companies will go elsewhere. They will go to the US, they will go to China where regulation is not as strict. And in the end, Europeans will have to rely on something that they actually don't want, namely a foreign non-EU technology that they can't control and that they can't really understand what's going on under the hood. Do you share those concerns or do you think they're overblown? Well, as most of the times, the answer is neither black nor white, right? So there's probably two perspectives or, or more to this question, but it's, I think, an extremely important aspect. And it's also one where we at Applied AI are very much focusing on. And also when we interact with the bodies in, in both Berlin or Brussels, where we really try to make a point about striking good balance. So I think critics are valid, right? I mean, what is going to happen and what we've seen also in studies that we conducted is that the AI Act will surely increase complexity. So, for instance, when it comes to high-risk AI systems, requirements around data governance, risk management, explainability, um, accuracy, and so on, they're 
just really difficult to implement from a technological standpoint. And we already now there's a scarcity of AI talent. Now, if you want to build those high-risk systems, you need more of that and, and deeper of that. And for some cases, it's not even like there's not a scientific solution to that, right? If you talk to really senior engineers about explainability, they you know might say at some point, well, we don't have an answer here. So it will make it harder and therefore also more complex and also more time intensive. That, of course, then leads to investors might be saying, well, you know, is this really where I want to go? And often also this idea of legal uncertainty is cited as a reason about not knowing what to expect. After all, it's a new law. Uh, we need to see how all the different agencies will interpret and also enforce it later on, be it on the national level or on the EU level. So there's a couple of reasons probably to say, well, maybe this is going to hurt us. That being said, it is there, right? So we, we can't avoid it. And I sometimes see discussions about, oh, should we have an AI act? And to me, I feel like the, the train passed the station, right? So we are going to have it most likely. We'll see what the voting says. But then I would invite actually everyone to kind of accept the challenge and say, okay, let's do it and let's leverage it to our benefit. Because after all, Europe as a continent, when you look into our economy, also Germany, for instance, the things that we are exporting, it's not because we're so cheap, but because things are so good. And we have a lot of export market in highly safety related fields. So I would rather invite our, you know, engineering teams and, and whatnot to find good solutions for exactly those challenges so that we are actually use this as a step stone to build indeed better products. And we see also from service that companies believe that if they're meeting those requirements, they're more perceived as a, as a role model and that users will be more comfortable basically using those AI systems. So hopefully gaining a larger market share. Plus, after all, it's a regulatory market entry barrier, right? So once you meet the compliance standards, well, it's, you can address the market until someone else makes the effort. So we can leverage this, but it's not going to come for free. So we really, it really takes an invested effort of all the private and the public sector to make this work. And this is the challenge, I guess, that we are standing ahead of. Do you think that Europe, by being at the forefront of regulation in that field, And also by obviously being an important market could uh, become some kind of a standard setter in uh, that field globally, because that is also something that is being said in other areas as well, you know, where you say, well, the EU is not a military power, but because of its economic heft as, you know, the world's largest single market, it has that power of reaching beyond its borders through regulations because other countries will just either fall in line or adopt their regulatory packages to the model of the EU. Do you think that might also happen in this field? It may to some extent. They often sort of cited Brussels effect. Yeah, I guess it always depends on who you talk to, <laughs> if that's seen as a, as, a, as a reality or not, or as a success or not. But what we do observe is that Europe is certainly one of the first regions making here an invested move. I mean, We also need to acknowledge that, for instance, China put out a regulation uh, earlier last year on generative AI. Of course, they come from a bit of a different angle. But I mean, Europe is not the only one, but certainly one of the first one being really active and deliberate here when it comes to AI regulation. I think a strength, if you want to take it on a positive note, is that Europe has been following a really long and consolidated process. I mean, not, not the emphasis on long, but it's taken time and inclusion and a stakeholder-oriented approach to make this happen, starting with the high-level expert group, I mean, more of a um, representative from, from society, um, science, um, industry, and so on. And now with the different hearings and possibilities through the process of making the AI for people to chip in, basically. And of course, now we see the colleague is later kind of making those political deals on the last few meters. So it's a very deliberate process. And we compare this to the US, for instance, where the executive order was, I mean, of course, there were also hearings and so on before, but it's just a different process on how stuff is being established. And then also the outcome maybe flies a bit longer if it's a proper regulation. And we see now already discussions about a possible a second Trump administration that they could undo some of what uh, President Biden has put into place. That on the one side, so it kind of goes with more depth, but it also links quite a lot to the international forum. When we look into the Hiroshima process, the work from the OECD, the Global Partnership on AI, there's lots of sort of spillover, so to speak, with folks from Europe into those fora and therefore also contributing, I guess, to global harmonization on AI regulation. 
You mentioned uh, the process in the EU obviously being slower than in some other jurisdictions due to the complexity of having a large uh, membership base there and lots of uh, consultations. That's another issue. How fast do you think such an act will be out Dated. Because to some extent, regulation always follows reality. So there is some kind of innovation and then regulation comes later. And the problem that I see or maybe also others is that obviously with the pace of change that we see in AI, where literally every day something new seems to be coming out, that will make it much harder for regulation to catch up and we've seen it with i guess with the internet i mean even there you know that was much lower the the advent of the world wide web and all these kind of things even there we saw that regulation struggled to keep up now we seem to be in an age where the the technological progress is multiplied doesn't that make the thing maybe even at the point where it comes into force already half redundant And that's a very valid point that you stress here. And I, I couldn't agree more. It's it's a really tough challenge. And and even during the making of the AI Act, we've seen that, for instance, the launch of ChatGPT really sort of stirred up stuff and really brought up an entire new chapter, which we now have an AI Act. And so I totally agree. And that's also why we from, from Applied AI side have been pushing for two main things. I mean, for many others, but on that note, we pushed for active monitoring that whenever the AI Act is rolled out, that there should be measures in place on the EU and member state level to actively monitor what are things that are happening, on the, be it on the technology side, be it on the usage side, be it on, on risk and incidents that may rise or actually disappear over time because of technological changes. But then also, and that's maybe even more important, to have um, mechanisms in place to adjust the rules, basically, be it through guidelines, be it um, through other types of acts, be it through standards, but to be absolutely sure that if we observe major shifts in the AI landscape, that the legislator is both able and also willing and capable of adjusting the regulation. So we totally agree to this point and, and we really hope that now when we set up all those governance systems that yeah, those bodies and measures will be put in place. Till we have two fixed segments in our podcast, as I guess you know, I hope you know, and I would like to get to the first one, which we call Executive Briefing, what you should read now. The idea is that we will ask our guests to give us one, two, three reading recommendations if they want to dive in a bit deeper into what we've been discussing here. So please go ahead and give us your suggestions. Thank you. So my focus is very much on the AI Act. So I would actually recommend everyone having a look into that document. I know it's a big one, but if you have a team, you know, split it up. But I think now is the time for everyone to get familiar with the AI Act, with the provisions in there to really find out what does it mean to you and your organization. So that's number one. And number two would be basically an invitation to check out our website. I'm just going to do some advertisements here. We are, we're a nonprofit, but we are set up to be the open access accelerator for trustworthy AI. So what it means is we want to help organizations to kind of eat the elephant by you know, breaking it down into smaller digestible parts. We have a number of studies, uh, more will come. We have information material, we have tools, templates, trainings, and so on, and a growing portfolio of those things to help organizations of all kinds in the EU and beyond to yeah, navigate through the AI Act. So I invite you all to, to check that out. Great. Thank you very much. And as always, we will put links to both your organization and to the text of the AI Act into the show notes so that people can find them there and check those resources out. Let's talk a little bit about what regulation means for business. And obviously, There are businesses that are in the field of AI, so they're developing tools and services and language models in the field of AI. And then there are companies that want to use or make use of those new services for whatever product services they produce themselves. I think also when I talk to companies, uh, there is a large amount of uncertainty, especially on the user side is, you know, what can we do? What happens to sensitive data, both personal data, customer data that we have, but also maybe things such as patent uh, material and other confidential information about products and so on and so forth. So will regulation help in that field? 
Or could it also make things more difficult, especially for smaller companies? Because I think what we've seen with a lot of regulation, whether this is the GDPR regulation a while ago or now ESG taxonomies or all sorts of regulation that is coming, usually small and medium-sized companies have more difficulties because they cannot afford to set up a large legal team that is dedicated to that. Do you think it will make things more difficult also for the the business user perspective or might it even help because it will give people more certainty what they can and what they cannot do? I believe there's certainly a learning curve where we are, we are looking at simply because most of the users just don't know that this law is existing um, and, and what it means to them. I think it's also important to acknowledge that Existing law continues to apply, I guess, right? Things like the GDPR, or if you have NDAs for, you know, handling uh, classified data uh, secrets and those kind of things, that continues to apply. So if if there was something that you didn't do before with your personal data, you probably shouldn't do this <laughs> um, when you're dealing with an AI system. What might hopefully become a little bit easier over time, but that remains to be seen, is questions about um, liability. So if I'm a company and I'm um, purchasing the AI system and I'm using it for something, then hopefully the AI Act helps to clarify those responsibilities because the providers of those systems are now required to provide certain information about the system, about, about its performance, about its interfaces, um, the data that it should or should not be used for it, including intended purposes and so on. So hopefully questions about liability will become a bit easier. Now, since we've been pointing to, to generative AI, there's a whole plethora of challenges when it comes to uh, privacy, um, copyright, and so on. And that seems to be almost like an entire field by in itself. So we hear of efforts on the EU side even to start a revision, not sure if it has been started, not sure if it's still in this presidency, but really taking the copyright law as such and, and try to fix some of those Gen AI related copyright challenges in the copyright law where it belongs to. So I think that's a bit of a melting pot and disentangling the different laws and how they interact, that's indeed a challenge where we see um, also some questions popping up. I think as a user of an AI system, it's the first source of information should be the provider, right? Because they <laughs> make it available to you so they hopefully have answers to most of your questions. And then I would also recommend just to be really explicit about Like, what is it that you're using this AI system for? I think from the from the moment you are like using it for kind of something, some chat GPT which can do anything for you is very different to some, say, quality control thing in your production line, which checks the screws of that type. So I think it's good to be explicit and deliberate about what is it that you're trying to do and then find a model that suits that need. And then I think you also have much less questions when you know what's the scope and to keep this narrow. You mentioned a very important part uh, that is copyright, uh, IPO in, in general, that will or is already being affected by artificial intelligence. The New York Times, they are suing OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. I think they're asking for, was it 1 billion or 7 billion? Huge amount of money and damages because they are arguing that uh, the model, the OpenAI language model, was trained in great part on copyrighted material from the New York Times and probably other publishing houses, authors and so on are in similar situations. When you look at image generating tools, uh, you can ask any of them to produce a painting that looks like a Monet, which in the case of Monet is probably not that much of an issue because he's long dead and copyright has expired. But of course, you can do the same with uh, living authors or living artists as well. Is that uh, something that is being covered in the AI Act or is that something that would have to be addressed, as you said, separately in other regulations? That's a very good question. I, and I need to admit that since the, the full draft just leaked, I didn't read the final part on general purpose AI. But I remember from the discussion in the um, negotiation phase that it was at one point proposed to actually uh, require those foundation model providers to disclose fully disclose all the material that they have used for training the model. So I'm not sure if that ended up in the final text, but there are some transparency requirements indeed. And also there's some provisions around copyright. I couldn't cite them now in detail, but copyright has been addressed for those large models. And so any 
provider of them would yeah have to look into this and to see what it means for them. I mean, I think this is an interesting question that is beyond like the narrow scope of legal texts and it's a matter of how we want to address this as a society. So as an expert, what is your take? Because there's so much information going into these models that it's really hard, probably even for the New York Times, uh, to determine what was their share of a particular text. Now, if you maybe look at you and me, we've also written stuff that is somewhere online. So in one way or another, in very, very tiny fashions, you know, our intellectual property, our input might also turn out to be used for, for some of these things. But it's, it's very hard, if not impossible, to make that connection, I guess, and then also determine, you know, what fraction of a cent you and I should be paid in a particular instance. How will society, in, or how should society get out of that conundrum and adapt maybe the notion that we have of copyright. Because, I, I mean, when I talk to people also, I work at a business school, often people say, well, it's plagiarism. But it's not really because the AI creates something new. And it's uh, in a certain way, it's what humans have been doing for ages is reading other stuff, finding new insights. Artists look at uh, the works of other artists and get inspired. So in a certain way, it's very much like human behavior, but it's automatized. And that is something I think we're still, as societies, struggle to get our heads around. Probably I can't offer a solution, but maybe just a perspective and just thinking out loud here. I mean, looking at the input side of such large models, I could totally sympathize with all the content creators who say, well, I've created this content. I put a lot of work into this. It has a value under existing law. I'm entitled to have some gains from my work. So I totally kind of get that point. And I think it's important to uphold those rights. On the output side, I believe it's it's always a question of what are you actually trying to do with this? So we, for instance, when you look at the sort of creative industries, a movie versus a newspaper article. Now, I can't create many great newspaper articles based on historic data because it's it's very timely, so to speak. But if I watch a movie that is many years old, I can still you know enjoy this a lot. So, so therefore, I think the question is like, who is using those models for what in terms of copyright? Am I writing a timeless poem or will I write the news for tomorrow, which are useless in a week from now? So there, I think the content creation part matters a bit, but then also, the question about more on a, on a non-commercial side. So I can, with those protected contents, I can, of course, create other novels and media, but I can also create something that's causing harm. So for instance, just now we're seeing um, investigations into this case with Taylor Swift, where explicit images have been created using her portrait, so to speak. So now that was based also on, on maybe images that, that were protected from her personally. So it's not only the commercial aspect, but also something that actually can cause damage. As a last point, I would maybe shed a light on the question of what are those models actually being used for? Because what we've seen, I guess, is at the moment we see large models which are basically trained on all the data from the Internet. And that in itself has a, you know, I guess more of an English speaking flavor to it. And we know that you know, there's also a lot of, uh, excuse me, but rubbish on the Internet and it all goes into this. Now, if we ask ourselves, well, what do we actually need for like high quality applications if I'm working at the court uh, or if I'm an architect and I want to make a technical drawing, then an average quality is not just good enough. So maybe we also need to look at this maybe as just one step of the evolution. And maybe in a year or two from now, we see, see those large models which are much more curated in the content on which they're trained on. If I'm a you know, technical drawer, then it does make a difference if, if the line is, is straight or 99% straight. So there's, I think, maybe some industrial grade models coming up where also the providers are much more selective deliberately on what content they use, whereas at the moment it's just all in and then they see what comes out. So that would mean that you're predicting or you, you say that we might see a kind of a plethora of different siloed data systems popping up where you could say, for example, citing the New York Times, they could have an AI system that just relies on uh, articles that have been published in the New York Times, for example, and you could license, you could pay them something to be able to use that, or you could have a an art generator that uh, is just trained on... I don't know, on artworks that are exhibited in the top 500 art galleries in the world or something like that where you would say, you know, you, you have some kind of a curated 
quality control on the input side and therefore you assume that the output will also be quality controlled in a certain way? Potentially. And we see this, I mean, some refer to this as fine tuning as a, as a step that you do kind of on top of the model. We see, for instance, now in Germany, companies like, like Aleph Alpha working with the state of Baden-Württemberg. I think it's called the F13 model where they really try to use like a, a text corpus from the German law, from the German administration. And that, of course, makes it much more refined. And in the course of such a larger endeavor, I might say, well, I want to use a model as a basis, which also has certain properties. And then I need to be really, I guess, careful about what input do I rely on? And I mean, all that could have certain flavors from political fuels to societal bias and whatnot. Maybe it's fine as is, I don't know. But I think there's an interest for anybody wanting to use those models for something that's really impactful, just to fully understand the entire pipeline, including the training data. So there's an intrinsic need to be more precise on what is the training data and is actually useful for the purposes that I have in mind. A lot of it seems to rely at the end of the day, not only on regulation, but also on trust. And now that is also the, the title of your position, actually, as being the head of trustworthy AI. Could you explain us a little bit what you mean by that? What is, is trustworthy? What, what does that mean in the context of AI for you? Now, I would actually refer to, to the definition also what the EU proposes, which says that a, a trustworthy AI system is one that is legally compliant, that is um, ethically aligned, and that is technically robust, or robust in a, in a technical term. So it's really those three things, meeting the, the legal requirements, meeting the, the requirements from the people using it, the values they have in a more ethical sense, and also then, of course, that system being technically so, like solid from a technical standpoint. These are the main three pillars. And at Applied AI, I mean, we, we're tackling this from different angles. Me personally and the team, we're focusing very much on the AI Act, which is based on the EU principles for trustworthy AI. And we see them also in the in those high risk requirements, meaning, for instance, that there should be a certain level of transparency, explainability, robustness, accuracy, and so on. But we then also have other teams that apply the AI, which just make a contribution from their angle. For instance, we have a strong education and academy team providing skills and knowledge to all the people being involved in both the development and also the deployment process. Uh, we have other teams, the transfer lab, for instance, really focusing on the, the latest research that's coming out, where we know that practitioners don't have all the time to read all the papers. So this team is really sifting through this, compiling uh, summaries and making it accessible to machine learning engineers in those large organizations uh, or small, whatever. Or we have an engineering team that helps developing tools. So when you think about your machine learning pipeline lifecycle, one tool that we just recently launched is on a data versioning. So if I have a, a data set for training, for testing, for validation, maybe I create it and I you know, do the training, I find, okay, it's not so great. So I change the data, I have a, a new data version. And implementing this in your development tool stack is a tough problem, right? And so I wouldn't say that I have the answers, but it's more a team effort where we tried from different angles to help make this idea happen. It's more uh, a process to get there. And trust with the eyes, I guess, the goal that we all have in mind in common. Till, the other fixed segment in our podcast is what we call... A bold prediction, the world in 10 years. And there we ask our guests to give us their crystal ball assessment of how the world will look like in 10 years. So what would be your bold prediction for AI and AI regulation in 10 years from now? Well, it's really hard to predict. So I much rather say what I hope it will look like <laughs> as an aspiring image, I guess. I hope that in 10 years from now, we will see AI being used a lot. And I mean, that's probably not a, a wish. It's, it's, I mean, we see it already being used a lot. So, but I guess in the 10 years, we will see AI being used all over the place in both private and professional settings. What I hope with respect to AI regulation is that it delivers on its promise, meaning that it really gives a stable environment for both developers and deployers to bring those systems on the way to make them accessible to the users in a way that is meaningful, that people are comfortable using those systems, that the responsibility is shared equally, so to speak. And I hope, particularly from a European standpoint, that because of that stability and added clarity, because after all, it's a really complex 
topic we're dealing with, and I hope the regulation can cut through this complexity a bit by making things more explicit, that we as a continent can leverage that added clarity as a competitive edge, right? Uh, Europe has, has, a, has a history of making complex products. Think of aerospace programs and, and other things where really European projects have come up and the European society has come together. And I really hope that we can manage this. It will depend on many things that are you know, in our hands, I guess, as a collective. I hope that we can leverage AI regulation to our benefit so that people are more uh, comfortable using it and also that it leads to a more prosperous, I guess, AI economy made uh, in Europe. We've come to the end of uh, this episode. Till, thank you very much for giving us your insights into a fascinating and fast evolving uh, topic. So we'll see what comes out and we'll bring you back uh, onto the show to see where we stand in probably not too long a distance. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Matthias, for having me. This was another episode of the Business Diplomacy Today podcast. This podcast is presented by the Indo-German Center for Business Excellence. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe to it on your favorite podcasting platform. And of course, we would also be delighted if you would leave a review or a rating there. You can also go to our website at businessdiplomacy.today to check out the show notes of this episode. And that's it for today. Thanks for listening.